recording. So your day wasn't good then? Days. <laughs> You've been reading this book for a long time. It, it just took so long to get through because so much of it is so boring. Well, that's not why it's been so long since we've had a video. You have a new job, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like other things are going on, like we do have lives. This is not our primary breadwinning activity. <sighs> Maybe one day. I don't know if I'd want that, man. I mean, big YouTubers almost inevitably have like some kind of big depression situation where mm -hmm. like they stop making videos and they go offline and six months later they're like, hi, I wanted to kill myself. And I'm like, I'm already there. Like, I don't need that. You know what? That is absolutely fair. I'm already so mentally ill. I don't need, like, fame and fortune to make it happen for me. <laughs> Although I love fame and fortune. Well, I love fortune. I don't want fame. I, I just want to make stuff. I, I, well, yeah, I mean, it'd be great. If, I wish there were more work-a-day creators, you know? Like, make a an average income, like, a slightly above average income, but you get to just kind of, like, work in your niche. Yeah. Like, I don't, I want, I don't, I don't need fabulous wealth. I just need, like, a paycheck. <laughs> I don't need to be famous or big. I just want to be able to make what I want. Like sustainably. Sustainably and ethically. Oh my god. Well, uh, I don't know. Is anything ethical? We've all seen The Good Place. But yeah, this book. This book took so a lot out of you. Oh my god. A couple years off your life. I. I don't know. I need to read something. Something light and fluffy. Not even light and fluffy, like, it actually, like, sustainable, life-affirming. <laughs> but anyway, so this video, Sam read All the Bright Places. The broken John Places. All the Broken Places. All the Bright something else. But yeah, John I couldn't even get the title right. I kept thinking, like, halfway through it that it was All the Quiet Places, but no, it's All the Broken Places. That's how unmemorable this book is. I couldn't even remember the title properly. It's the sequel to The Boy in the Striped Pajamas that nobody asked for, um, but, like, Basically, the idea was we were like, oh, wow, this book is probably going to be very bad and also panned by all Jewish critics. And like, we'll see what happens. So Sam read it and I'm here to react to her having read it and we'll see what happens. I think it's going to be bad. So I've got some serotonin in reserve in case we, if you can't make it at home, Strobot is fine. <laughs> like, just to let you know how bad this book is, it had me rooting for a domestic abuser. Yeah, that definitely, like, that almost never happens to me. I'm almost never reading a book like, and I'm like, mm, this person really should beat that other person up. Like, you know that meme, worst person you know just made a great point? That is, like, half of this novel. <laughs> oh no, this is a And not even start. the main character. This is a bad start. <laughs> I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> oh my god. And just to let you know, I have, like, how many pages of notes did you say you have? This is 36. Is that longer than like our longest video? I have no idea. Granted, these are quotes and then some of the things I wanted to say, but mm -hmm. still we have like 30 some odd pages here. So dear God, um, All right, we'll grab some us. snacks and maybe an alcoholic beverage. We're not, uh, we're not gonna play a drinking game because Dangerous. I don't want anyone to die, but Coca-Cola, water. We're staying sober for this because otherwise we might just start crying. Also, it's a Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, it's Wednesday, my dudes, and that means we all have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, let's start your notes so that we can get out of here before we die. Before oh, we get... Really quickly first, John Boyne has been criticized before. Oh, I mentioned this a lot. Oh, like, okay. Please, please just watch my previous video. Yes. Yeah, so if you're interested in why John Boyne has been criticized before for his depiction of the Holocaust and Jewish people generally, you can go watch Sam's other video, which we will link right here. It will put in the title. Yes, there. but I have a, like a whole little thing. But I'll let you even get thing. into the quotes. Let me get into your thing then. Go ahead. Um. So the first thing I noticed about this book, it's dedicated to Marcus Zusak, <laughs> who is the author of the book Thief. An is, actual Jew. Yeah, an actual Jew whose book is also about young people during the Holocaust. And frankly, I am very disturbed about this. Like, Zusak, are they friends? Are you friends? Like, what the hell? Are you okay with this? Did you read this book? Or please tell me that John Boyne just kind of went off. Well, um, there's been some criticism of Marcus Zusak's depiction of the Holocaust, too, but I think 
A, his is more, his book is just really good. And his is more faithful to like actual historical events and doesn't negatively, also, like, it's not a bad, I um, think it's like, if you're writing historical fiction, you don't have to be faithful to all historical events, why it's fiction. But Marcus Zusak didn't write anything actively damaging. Right, and the main, the narrator is death. Yeah, so like it's an interesting good book. And it doesn't, I mean, like, as a kid, I was like, this isn't, this isn't a Jewish book, because most books that I'd read at that point about the Holocaust were Jewish. But, like, it does, like, it's actually just a really good book. If you want to read a good book about the Holocaust, The Book Thief is a good book. Or, like, The Devil's Arithmetic. But, like, you know, ultimately, like, that's really, I feel like that's really insulting. Unless Marcus is, like, signed off on it, that's, like, a weird, that, that's a very, very weird If line. he did sign off of it, on it. I, I think less of him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm concerned. Not that I believe in guilt by association, but like weird. Seriously, dude. Weird what vibes. The hell? Weird vibes. Okay. Come on, Mark. So the second thing I noticed was the table of contents. So the We're still on the table of contents. <laughs> Are we going page by page? Basically. Oh dear God. So while the chapters don't have titles, the book is separated into three parts. And the three parts have titles. The first two aren't bad. It's The Devil's Daughter and The Beautiful Scars. So, no one cares. Unmemorable. Whatever. Part three is what concerns me. It's called The Final Solution. No. Why? Why did you do that? <laughs> like, who let this get through the editing process? Did even one Jewish person read this book? You don't call. The Final Solution is like a joke that I make when I look at like a bowl of popcorn and I'm like, it's almost finished solution like yeah it's not something you write about your book where the protagonist is like hitler's right hand's daughter like i that's a lot that's a lot right there but secondly like when you said oh how did this get through editing did a new jewish person i don't think any jewish person read this first of all and second of all i have a theory that like maybe john boyne after all the bad press and like, maybe he hasn't had a hit in a while i don't know when his last book came out but my theory is just that he needed to pay some kind of big bill and they were like, write this book. And he's like, okay. Because it's been like, what, like 15 years since the last time? Something like that. I was actually, at the end, there's an author's note. And he's like, oh, I'd always plan to write this book. But, you Did know, you? when I'm like 80 or 90. Did you? But then the pandemic came and I'm like, you know what? Now's a good time to write this. And I think he just pulled it out of More his ass. Like pulled it out of his ass. And he wrote it as a response to all his critics. Unfortunately, he made everything worse. <laughs> and everything got worse. I think what probably happened is the pandemic happened and his speaking fees dried up. Because a lot of authors will like make a lot of money going places and talking. And a lot of people wrote books during the pandemic, a lot of celebrities, because they couldn't do speaking fees, engagements, TV, like whatever. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so like maybe that's it. Because like... I'm more on the side that he would, that this was mostly a response to all the critic criticism he was getting. Yeah, I mean, I think especially because there's been such a reckoning in like the literature world about how the Holocaust is affected lately. Yeah, and you know, right now Boyne isn't on like any social media because he was getting bullied. I think I, they just didn't want him to do a JK Rowling and say like, well, the he trends was, are like. He got criticized by the Auschwitz Memorial. Yeah, I mean, I did see a really funny tweet today that was like, the worst punishment they can think of for anyone who does anything bad to Jews is to send them to the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> I saw that too. It was really good. Anyway, go on. Move and continue. Okay. So, finally, <laughs> we finally arrived at chapter one. Yeah. Um, so, no one ever promised Jews were short-winded. <laughs> Um, so this is the first line of the book. If every man is guilty of all the good he did not do, as Voltaire suggested, then I have spent a lifetime convincing myself I am innocent of all the bad. I don't even really get what that means. I think that it's like it's meant to be like a complicated moral statement. Like it's meant to be like a, I'm very deep situation. Yeah. Also, this book is written in first person, and I don't tend to. In Enjoy first person narratives that much. I like it if it's like self referential, like if it's like, yeah, this is a first person narrative. Like, it depends on the writing quality. Yeah, and the writing quality here sucks. Um, a lot of part one is like deeply unnecessary in background. So, we're, but how many pages is this book? Well, I was on the online copy, so mine was yeah, different, but it's like 300 some odd pages. 300 too long. Yeah. 
Okay, hit me. Okay, chapter two. Because that's the only thing notable about part one. Okay. Chapter two. Mother and I escaped Germany in early 1946, only a few months after the war, traveling by train from what was left of Berlin to what was left of Paris. Again, this doesn't seem bad on the outside, but I don't like how they use the term escape because it makes them seem like victims like refugees of like yeah. the war that their people financed and did <laughs> like yeah and the thing is like we're gonna talk a lot of shit right now but i'm not unsympathetic to the plight of german people after the holocaust right we're just unsympathetic to this specific german person yeah like there are real people who are probably still alive today who experienced like starvation and like really terrible discrimination against German people for just being German. Like it's just a lot of bad shit that happened as a result of the Holocaust who might not have done anything bad. But, but like, this is a very shitty book with a shitty protagonist and she deserves to feel bad. You should feel bad in your bra. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next sentence. For our protection, we remained hidden in the basement of those few true believers whose homes were still standing until we could be provided with false papers that would ensure safe removal from Germany. Now, I'm not sure if this is on purpose or not, but it seems like a direct parallel to, you know, the Jewish people who were being hidden during World War II. I mean, that's definitely intentional, but also the idea that, like, they were hidden by truth. So there are Nazis that are hiding other the Nazi associated people because she and her mom are not like, I mean, her dad was a member of the Nazi party. So the whole family. Her dad was a very high ranking member of the Nazi party. Yeah, her dad is a high ranking official. Um, and so like, this is literally just like, I mean, I can't help but be like, wow, are we supposed to feel bad? Are you supposed to feel bad? Like, I, I think, think we are supposed to feel bad to an extent, like, it, it gets worse later in the book. And like I said, I don't believe in guilt by association. But if you are married to and the daughter of a very high ranking Nazi commandant, you are benefiting from all of the, like all of the, you know, those women took the jewelry from Jewish people, but like they had shops full of their clothing that they made them to, they made them run. They like took their fancy clothes and made the women in the camps run the shops to sell them their own clothes. And they took their jewelry and they like, you are a collaborator. <laughs> yes. Um, you are complicit, my guy. I was frightened, although it shocked me to think that anyone could consider me complicit in these atrocities. <laughs> it's true that since my 10th birthday, I had been a member of the, okay, I can't pronounce it, but the you Hitler know, youth. The, the basically the female Hitler youth, but, but so had every other girl in Germany. It was mandatory after all, just like being a part of the Deutsche Jungwall was compulsory for 10 year old boys. And here we have Boyne like correcting some of his mistakes from the past because he made it seem like, oh, these people didn't know what was happening. He's presenting the idea that, oh yes, she was in this, you know, Hitler youth adjacent group, but the some, somehow she still didn't know anything, which doesn't make any sense. Like they were not subtle. This wasn't like, Girl Scouts. I love the idea of Nazi Girl Scouts. Like, <laughs> sell your Thin Mints and also Jews are a contaminant. Don't forget, don't forget to report anyone doing something suspicious. And don't forget, also, we have these flyers. Put one up in your school. We're going to be in front of the grocery store. And also, Heil Hitler. <laughs> like, I love the idea. I'm sorry, what's the no, it's very funny. You should laugh. You should laugh. This is very funny. I'm great. My point is that, like, he's, he's correcting, like, he's kind of retconning his thing from the four, but, like, like mm -hmm. they're so innocent and they didn't know anything. I buy that a six-year-old boy doesn't understand what Hitler Youth is when he's in Hitler Youth. I don't buy that a girl, like, she's, like, what, 15? She was 12 when in the first book. So she's 12. At 12, like, you, you know, know better. And also, kids are very perceptive. Like, especially, like, if you're 12 and it's been going on since you were 10, you've been in there two years. You I mean, also, her dad was basically one of the most powerful men after Hitler. She would have known. There's no reason he would have. And this is, this is a fictionalized character, right? Her dad. Yeah. Okay. I assume it's supposed to be fictionalized because we never learned her last name. Oh, okay. So they just, he was, like, kind of, like, generic Nazi guy. 
generic high-ranking Nazi dude. Mm. And that's these actually, are really, and these it's, a, it's a drink at my favorite bar, generic Nazi dude. Oh, hi, buddy. No, you can't drink that. But if you want to hang out, you can. And these are real organizations, and it, this doesn't go into the whole propaganda. Like, they were not so. She would have known. She would have seen, like, the ethnicity charts. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. This Which is what a Roma is. This is what a Roma looks like. Well, they wouldn't say Roma. This is what a Jew looks like. You know, like, pin the nose on the Jew, like, level shit. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Okay, and now I have this whole rant. Um, Boyne is just trying to justify all the mistakes in his last book without doing it in any meaningful sort of way, like listening to Jewish people, in which case he wouldn't have written this sequel at all. And he's trying to make it up by doing research, but really it's like the bare bones of it. Well, and I think it's also like, this the idea of this book in general is also really disrespectful of like German people dealing with like, the fallout of two world wars for which they took the brunt of the, like, the, what's it called? The, the, the austerity measures. Like, he's not German. He's not related to anybody who deal with this kind of thing. Like, it's one thing to, like, write the story of, say, your German grandmother who, like, ate tulip bulbs to survive or whatever. Yeah. But, and it's another thing to be a rich Irishman. Like, write about the troubles, my guy. That's your thing. Yeah, like, I'm not saying you can't write about something that's not associated with your culture, but if you're going to, you have to do research, and he didn't. Yeah, and this part um, just bothers me. Um, so it, this is chapter three. She mentions her deceased husband. At this point, she's 90 years old. All the odd chapters are present day. All the even chapters are in the past. Which, I don't mind that as a structure. No, no, I'm yeah. just explaining. But that's how it is, yeah. But she mentions her late husband, and he had a toothbrush, toothbrush mustache. So a Hitler mustache. Yes. In France? In like the post-war period? Does that even seem likely? I don't think anyone tried to do it until like Michael Jordan tried to bring it back. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah. He had like, for a couple like weeks, he had it. Like an attempt to like, you know, do it again. Look it up. <laughs> Google Michael Jordan Hitler mustache. Okay, okay. I'm going to do that right now. Are you sure it was Michael Jordan? Oh yeah, um, it's a really bizarre picture. <laughs> doesn't that make you like deeply uncomfortable? Like it doesn't look right. Like it looks photoshopped, right? <laughs> I'm glad I could bring some joy to your day. Yeah, so obviously unrealistic. And she says he looked a bit like Ronald Coleman, who I, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Probably okay, like I, an old school actor. Yeah, English born actor, career in theater and film. Oh, and he doesn't even have a toothbrush mustache. I mean, he's handsome in that, like, turn of the century sort of way. Yeah. It's Italian, maybe? Oh, I guess he's British. Yeah. Eh. Eh. But, like, does Boy know what a toothbrush mustache is? Does he think it's a thin one? Maybe he's thinking of, like, the, like, the, um, there's, like, a different kind of mustache that's, like, a handlebar mustache, and he just kind of, like, yeah, um, didn't get past that. Yeah. Anymore. Okay, we can really skip this part. It's just her neighbor wondering, like, oh, who's going to move into the flat below us? And she's like, oh, what about the Jews? There was a time when buildings like this one didn't accept Jews. I don't mind myself. I'm open to all sorts. I've always found them a very friendly people, if I'm honest. Surprisingly cheerful, considering all they've been through. And I should note that um, she's like 70 something and she's in like the throes of dementia. Her neighbor? Oh, the neighbor is 70 something and throes of dementia. Okay, yeah. I guess that's kind of a normal thing for a demented person to say that. Yeah, like she's not, her name's Heidi. Um, is she a figment of her imagination or something? Oh, no, worse. Oh, it gets worse. Okay, cool, 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 cool. No, Very so cool. Gretel, Gretel cares, you know, keeps an eye on her and stuff. But Heidi's basically, I love a 90 year old caring for a 70 year old. <laughs> like, you'll, you'll find out why. Okay, okay, we'll get there, we'll get there. And you know, it's, it's fine. I didn't see the point in Heidi. And frankly, I still don't even having read the whole book, but she, she has dementia. She's not all there. So she's just blathering on about random stuff. Sure. And I just, although I, didn't, like, I, I guess, guess it was, this was Boyne's like pop way of like bringing up, oh, Here's, like, how she starts wondering of, and thinking about all this crap. 
I guess it does occur to me that like if she has dementia, she might be thinking back to like a time when housing segregation did include Jews. Oh yeah, no, that's what she said. Right. That right. Ha- this place used to not accept Jewish people. Well, because whole towns were actually built in America and Jersey and suburbs because <laughs> so, um, this is in England. Oh well, I know this. Is, oh, she's in England. She's in France. No, no, no. She's in France as as a teen. As a teen, and then she moves to England. Yes. Well, they like bigotry more there. For the French are very notoriously yeah. um, anti-fascism, yeah, pro bigotry. Yeah. But the English are pro fascism and pro bigotry, so she'll be right at home. Yeah. So that's just kind of like a one-off thing. Um. She, and she goes into this whole bit about how. She likes history, like ancient history, like Greeks and Romans, but she avoids like recent history for obvious reasons. I will say that like I have this joke that every like class has some guy in it who's obsessed with ancient Rome. And it's just like, well, the Romans. <laughs> and, and then like, you have that one girl obsessed with ancient Egypt. Yeah, every girl had an ancient Egypt face. I had one. Yeah, of course. I had an ancient Egypt. I was after, I remember in like my ninth grade art history class, people were asking like all these questions about like the pharaohs and mummies. Like, why would they erase the names if they thought, you know, the pharaohs were gods? Because you know, some of the king pharaohs had their names erased, and I and I went into this whole spiel. I love that for you. <laughs> and my the art teacher didn't have the answer, but I did. Um, also, that art teacher ended up being fired. Like later that year or the next year, he had a mental breakdown and locked a kid in a closet or something. You had an interesting childhood. My high school was very interesting. Mine too. I actually was thinking about that today. I wish that, like, you ever just wish that you could just, like, press a button and make everyone from a certain part of your life forget you? Middle school. For me, it's high school. Middle school. I, like, am embarrassed of, like, 13 to 12-year-old me, but I can, like, recognize her a little Uh, bit. I, I, I... It's not so much that I'm embarrassed if they're of like middle school me. It's just that I would rather forget all of middle school. I can live with having memories myself as long as nobody else does. For me, it's the knowledge that there's somebody walking around there who remembers me saying something just deeply idiotic. Because sometimes I'll tell Abe those things. I'll be like, "Oh, I used to think this," and he'll be like, <laughs> "Like you were so dumb." And I'm like, "That's really like I can handle it from him because he's my husband and I know he loves me." But like thinking, and about, I like, know I sometimes. Tease you a little. I don't mind you doing it either, because like people who actually like know me and know that I'm not that person anymore, it's fine with. But like the idea that there's somebody out there who still thinks that I'm like that, I'm like, oh no, no, no I never think anyone's like how they were in middle oh, school. Oh, we we all yeah. know like middle school and high school don't really count that much, especially middle school. That being said, I just still hold grudges. Oh, of course. Someone told me I had chicken legs in 10th grade in chemistry class. I've never forgotten it. I know her first and last name. I don't know where she went to school. I know her first and last name. If I ever see her again, she'll hear about it. Fair. I have great legs now. You were saying? This one I realize isn't really necessary, except that it introduces the idea that she never really calls Auschwitz by its name. Mm-hmm. She keeps calling it the other place uh. as a way to kind of distance herself. And it, it's like, I get it, but like, you're talking about it as though also the person who existed there was a different person than you are now. I mean, I can understand that as a writing choice if he'd written it as though she'd disassociated from her previous self, as though she'd written, he'd written that like she'd been mentally ill. And like, the reason that she was doing this was because she was like, not able to reconcile the person who she actually is with the person who like, stood that, by. That would be interesting. I think that's what he tries to do in this book, but he fails. Mm. Like, Gretel in this book is definitely has mental health issues. Me who wouldn't. But, like, like he doesn't really write it well. I feel like anyone born before a certain point, like, if you existed at a time of her washing machines, you're probably pretty depressed. Mm Mm-hmm. And, okay. Thankfully, we skipped a bit, and now we're up to chapter six. Oh, goody. (laughs) It was at moments like this, left alone with my thoughts that I struggled most with the complicated nature of my conscience. It's been three years since my brother died. So this is obviously her. As a young person. Yeah. And six months since my father was hanged. And I miss them both in different ways. My brother's loss was one I could scarcely allow myself to consider, but my father remains on my mind every day. I was slowly beginning to understand what he had been a part of, 
what we had been a part of. And the inhumanity of his actions contrasted so sharply with the man I thought I had known that they might as well have been two different people. I told myself that none of it had been my fault, that I had been just a child, but there was a small part of my brain that asked me, if I were entirely innocent, then why was I living under an assumed name? Is this like a common thing that like a lot of the families of prominent Nazis were like snuck out and like, I have no idea. Like, I was under the assumption that families were not targeted. Yeah, like there was this whole thing that Gretel and her mom are hiding because they're like, oh, they're gonna put you guys on trial and stuff. And I don't think any Nazi families really were put on trial. No. I mean, like, I, I never heard anything about that. Like, when I've done research on, like, the Eichmann trials and, like, much stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's, yeah, they, they never do that. They never put families, unless they were the women who were, like, active collaborators, like, you know, going into different, because sometimes, like, they did have female spies. Yeah. Like, Coco Chanel was a spy. But, like, yeah. they, the families usually were not, like, I mean, you'd lose your money, but that's fair. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it feels like it's supposed to be a direct parallel to, like, what the Jewish people were going through, but they're not equal. And me with that shit. And she was the daughter of this high-ranking German official. Who, and she would have known while she was at Auschwitz what was going on. And, like, she's like, I didn't know what was really happening. I slowly began to understand what he had been a part of. Like, she wouldn't have understood it before. Like, she would have smelled the smoke. No, I mean, like, she would have known, like, everything. If she was the daughter of a high-ranking Nazi official... She would have been highly involved. Like they, she would have been like present when he was taking meetings and like in the same house when he was like, I mean, also like, I, I mean, I know that there are a lot of like, like she would have, like she mentioned, she mentions this later, but like she, if she had been around other girls her age in Germany, like she would have been president of like the Hitler Youth for Girls. Sure. Because of her because father's... Because of her father being high-ranking. Yeah. Well, and, like, also the idea, like, I, I can kind of buy a little bit that maybe a six-year-old boy would not have, the, like, the... the Bruno action. was nine. No, he's nine? He was nine. Oh, oh, okay. That's worse. Uh, I still haven't read this book, and I never planned no, to. No, no. Bruno was nine in the book. Like, I could understand it if he was, like, five, but Bruno is nine, but he acts like he's much younger. Mm. Well... No, but he, he was nine. He would have known. Okay, yeah. My point is that, like, you know, at 12, like, if you're living adjacent to a death camp, you know it. Like, you'd see. They were not secretive. Like, they didn't... Yeah, I know. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And that's what John Boyne seemed to get, get through his, like, peanut sized mean, mind. In his interest in like depicting like a complicated character's internal life, he is interested in whitewashing their level of complicity. And like the thing is, it's more interesting to write about a character who was like, I witnessed all this stuff and I wasn't like super empowered at the time. But like, here's what I've done in the interim and how I have like internalized that as an adult. Like, if she could recognize, like, instead of being like, oh, I didn't know. I am such a tragic figure. Like, this could have been, like, a really interesting story in someone else's hands. Hmm. And this part just, it's one of the few things that bothers me. Here she's talking about her son. Sure. She has a kid. She has a kid. She is, again, this is present day, so her son's, like, in his 60s or whatever. Sure, because she's 90 or whatever. Yeah. As he stepped inside the flat, I noticed he had put on weight. He'd never been a slim child, but in adulthood, he began to work in the construction industry. His efforts on the building sites helped to keep him trim. But he started working on desk, blah, blah, blah. And now she says, it bothered me to see his stomach straining at the buttons up his shirt with such virulence and like completely unnecessary fat phobia. Yeah, I mean, if she's supposed to be like a mean, evil character, then like I kind of it, get like putting those thoughts in her head of like, oh, my son's fat and ugly. Like that's something that a bad person would think. Yeah, like, I think it's also supposed to frame her son as, like, not a great guy because throughout the book, he's, like, trying to get her to move out of her home and into, like, a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, I want to stay here. And he's seen as an asshole. And, like, she is perfectly capable of taking care of herself. But, like, but and, and he, she's like, he's just after my money. Ah, blah, blah, blah. But Why does she have money? Her husband. 
He was rich. Mm. Okay. And it's just like, it's like her, her son's kind of a dick, but like in just like the average kind of men. Kind and of and kind of like, oh, I've had three wives. Uh, yeah. But it, she's like, but also Gretel was not a good mother, so he has mommy issues. And it's just general, like more like general kind of dickishness. He's just kind of an asshole. He's not like a bad guy. He's not a bad guy. He's just kind of an average ass. Like well, other than wanting his mom's money and not being in like, a book with Nazis, if you're just kind of a little greedy and a little mean, like, like I, I am just like, you know what? I wouldn't like you, but you're not the worst character in this You're book. not the most irredeemable person on the page. So no, no. Stamp. He, he's probably one of the most redeemable characters. Like just a normal asshole. Yeah, just your average, ordinary, everyday asshole. Just somebody's uncle, really. Yeah. So, blah, 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 blah. We skip ahead to, we skip to the past again. And I think this is her mother's boyfriend who's saying this. In time, perhaps, he said, but not yet, I don't think. The guilty must be punished. This is the first time we hear someone make a comment about guilt and innocence regarding the war. And Gretel seems to take this very personally. And it just seems so ominous. Like, she's like, oh, the guilty must be punished. I'm guilty, but I don't want to be punished. She wants to avoid all consequences of her actions. Well, like, I don't think this is, like, this is very, like, this is, like, narcissist behavior of, like, I mean, children are very centered on themselves, but, like, to think, like, when somebody's talking about literal war criminals, but they're talking about you, feels very, like, she does feel guilt, and she can't reconcile that with, like, well, I didn't murder anybody. I was just there while it happened. And, like, I'm not saying that a 12-year-old girl could have single-handedly stopped the Holocaust. But, like, nobody was going to punish her in the first place. Yes, exactly. Um, and then there's a whole another paragraph about calories and fat phobia. Like, it just really seems unnecessary. And almost always, other than the bit about Kate, about her son, Caden, the fat phobia and calorie baiting is always re in regards to female characters. Mm. I guess John Boyne thinks all women are obsessed with calorie counting. Yeah, I don't think he can really write female characters. I mean, granted, I've only read two of his books, but... To be fair, it seems you've read the two that most people have read. Mm hmm I know he's got a couple others, but I don't know anything about them. I only see them on the shelf at work. In this, she's with a, she's 15, 16, with a guy, and she's like, I don't know, I said a little embarrassed. Oh, sorry, this is completely the wrong thing. She's not in the past, this is the present. I don't know, she's, I said a little embarrassed that she should be revealing so much when we had only introduced ourselves a few minutes earlier. Many people grow up to be utterly unlike their parents. And she's already defending herself when there was no accusation, nothing to defend. And, like, her whole identity is made up of, I am not like my father. But she also doesn't really do anything to separate herself. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I really don't believe in guilt by association. But if your dad's a Nazi, you kind of have to, like, find something to do with your life that is utterly opposed to Nazism. Like, that's just kind of, it's not fair. But life isn't fair. Yeah. Um, okay, chapter 10. And so now she's with this boy. She's in France. She's with this boy, Emile. Mm -hmm. She has a crush on him. And she finds out Emile's older brother had fought in the resistance and had been killed. And this is what Emile says. He fought in the resistance, he said, sitting up straight now as if to ensure he did not show any disrespect to the sacred organization. He killed his first German on the day the Nazi tanks rolled into Paris. Afterwards, he helped organize a chapter here and was captured twice and tortured before making his escape. He remained loyal to the end, however, never revealing names, no matter what was done to him. And, like, this isn't bad. That's a really good, I mean, I would love to read that guy's story. That sounds yeah, like I want to really, read that guy's story. That's a great right French hero right there. Yeah. And, it, but it's the way Gretel reacts to it. Like, again, like, this is about her. Mm -hmm. And then Emil kind of gets anti-German. But, like, I get it. I wish I'd been older than I could. Then I could have fought, too. 
I would have killed every last one of them. I would have stuck my knife in every German soldier's neck and dragged it slowly across. Which is a reasonable sentiment. Yeah, and it should be noted that at this time, Gretel and her mother are pretending to have always been French. Which is very impressive considering, like, accents and stuff. Yeah, like, they were... Yeah, and they bring this up, like... Just for so they're, they're in France. They're pretending they were never German. I might have a treat. And Gretel's feeling uncomfortable because, like, you know. That's oh, he wants to kill me. That's no good. He wants to kill me because I'm German. And he, it's like, no, he wants to kill Nazis. If you hear Germans and you think Nazis, that's a you problem. Mm-hmm. Especially considering this traumatized child who's lost his, like, only sibling. Yeah. Here, treat. And then he goes on. It can't be true, I don't think. He continued frowning, his face lost in despair. What they say about these camps and the things that went on there. It can't be true. Who could ever imagine such things? Who could ever create such places? When, like, everybody knew? Yeah. Well, the U.S. knew. How can there be such a collective lack of conscience? So this is... So good. people knew about the camps. People just didn't do anything. Uh, point to last is if only Nazi soldiers knew. When everyone knew, they just didn't care. France, most of the countries didn't get involved in the war because of the Jews. They got involved because, you know, German wasn't, Germany was invading. Yeah, I mean, when you start annexing countries, that's when the world governments get involved. And like... I mean, the only reason the U.S. ended the war was because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It had nothing to do with saving Jews. It was all about, they attacked us on our home soil, let's destroy them. And they first went after the Japanese. Yeah. Like, and he killed makes... Japanese school children. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't good either. Yeah, we're generally opposed to war crimes. Just, like, as a channel, I think that's a pretty blanket statement we can make. Yeah, he's trying to make everyone, like, Owen is under this impression that, like, this happened because no one knew. Like, it's, it's not complicity, can't. it's ignorance, which is yeah. so wrong. Like, people think, like, love the idea of ignorance as, like, a, a panacea for bigotry. But, like, we we know what's going on in China with the Uyghur camps, and no one's doing anything. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. could easily be like, we're going to put tariffs on all your goods and not accept anything until you, like, work on these human rights violations. But everybody has to get their goods from China, and they're too worried about, like, the economic ramifications of that. And like we, I mean, we, we're not one strong. We have our own concentration camps. And I mean, forget Guantanamo Bay, like we and are at the borders. Yeah, like not, I'm not saying all US citizens are complicit in like being war criminals, but our tax dollars pay for that. So like we yeah. have to reckon with that as Americans. Yeah. Like you can't, just say that, like, like no one is free of sin, basically. No one is free of sin. Mm-hmm. We are but, all like, canceled. But, yeah, he's making it out to seem like everyone else was kind-hearted people and only the Nazis were bad. When it's it, like that stupid Anne Frank quote, I believe all people are inherently good or whatever. Yeah. Ugh. Not that, you know, there's... Not that the quote was stupid, but that, you know, that was before she was taken to a concentration. People yeah. use it for bad. Yeah. Like, I think Anne Frank has been so exploited as a person. In, in her dad. Let this poor child rest. Yeah. And so then Gretel's like, a memory came to me. I was standing outside his office, her father's office, eavesdropping on a conversation that he was having with my brother who wanted to know who those people we saw every day from the windows were, the ones on the other side of the fence. And those people, father said, sounding almost amused by the question. Well, they're not people at all. My brother was unsatisfied with this answer, and later he asked me. I told him it was a farm. I said it was a place where animals were kept. So does she ever reckon, like, does she say, like, I lied to him because he was too young? Like, what? No, no, it's what she believed. And it's just this whole the idea that, oh, the Jews weren't people at all, and she just repeated what she heard. Well, what's confusing to me is that, like, if you were, like, it's not as though Germany did not have, like, a pretty large Jewish population, which is into, it's, not, it's not a going concern anymore. They took care of that. But, like, if you were, you probably knew a Jewish person. They was, lived in Berlin, so of course. Yeah, but, like, they knew, they would have seen, like, the signs of, like, you know, Jews sell all your possessions, Jews get out, like, all of them. Like, it's, it wasn't a quiet genocide. 
like it was it was very much like the Japanese um, internment camps here where there were signs put up and people went to churches and people went to schools and they told people you got to get the fuck out basically yeah like I don't get it it wasn't quiet and they would this just completely ignores like the whole build up to the Holocaust mm -hmm. it was not like a very sudden day when everyone was like let's like they, they rounded up all the trains in the country and were like all everyone gets on the trains now like it was an it was a, a years long process that was very well organized. That's why it's so like it was so effective. Yeah, they almost succeeded in exterminating like Eastern European Jewry. Yeah, I think it was like something like three quarters. It was a lot. I mean, we still haven't we recovered. still we still haven't recovered. Yeah, in terms of the population that we had before, all of the like entirety of Jews. Yes, if uh -huh. there if the six million people had not been murdered, there would be thirty six million Jews in the world now. And now there's like 14 million. Yep. Which is less than like 1% of the population of the world. Yeah. But we run the banks and the media, of course. Oh yeah, I just cashed my Uncle Soros check. <laughs> I swear, people, people legitimately, like, I was telling you the other day, people think that like I have so much money. And I'm like, do you think I'd be working? I wouldn't. Yeah. If I was independently wealthy, I wouldn't complain about anything. I would just have like my quiet, rich life. Well, I would complain, just not publicly. I'd complain to you. And then we'd go on our private jets to Coachella. I mean, of course we'd complain. We're Jewish. That's yeah, what we do. It's a cultural heritage thing. But I digress. Yeah. And I hate this line. Okay. Because she's like, hiding her German identity. She's, they've changed her last name. And now she's like, for the first time, I fully understood that I would have to lie about everything every day for the rest of my life if I was to survive. Oh, blow me. Yeah. And it's also had me thinking like so many Jews after the war, they hid their Jewishness because they were afraid mm -hmm. that it was going to happen again. And there were also so many people who had their Jewish identity, like literally taken away from them. Yeah. Kids. Like, kids. They were put into churches for, you know, safekeeping. And then they, the churches converted all the kids, adapted them out to Christian families. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, we never had any Jews here. Yeah. I mean, there's like, there's a whole like kind of tour circuit that I've read a little bit about in Europe called there used to be Jews here basically. And they go around all the places where all the Jewish stuff used to be. And they're like, oh, this is where it was and we destroyed it. And like the Catholic church specifically is complicit in like the stealing and rehoming yeah. of so many Jewish kids. And after the war, when people were like trying to reunite with families with this huge, and this is before the internet, of course. So like, it was like vague descriptions and maybe some pictures and like descriptions of who people were and when they were born and what their names might've been before the war. Like, it's a miracle that anyone found anyone at all. Yeah, and I remember, I don't know if this is true or not, like, a rabbi went into some of these orphanages and stuff mm -hmm. looking for Jewish children, and he started saying the Shema, because mm -hmm. they said, oh, there are no Jewish people here, and he took all the kids who started reciting mm -hmm. the Shema after him, because that's, like, the first prayer Jewish kids would have learned. Mm -hmm. You learn it before when your mom says goodnight to you. Yeah, but, like, I find it so... Like, it's one, like, it's another level of dehumanization, you know? Like, you don't deserve to raise your own children. Yeah. And, like, not only that, you don't deserve to raise your own children, but we're going to raise them in our faith and in our culture, and we're going to take them away from you, and we're going to lie to you. And so they never, they never told people where their kids were sent, and there were records. They just destroyed them. So, like, to this day, I think about, like, all those, like, old survivors who, like, died in nursing homes all over the country, like, who just don't know what happened to their children. And I mean, it happened, it didn't happen, the adoption thing didn't happen to my family, but like a couple decades ago, um, my grandfather heard from a cousin whose mother had survived the old country and they were on the other side of the world. And so they wrote to each other and they met and it was just like very emotional because they didn't know anyone else had survived. It happened to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I can't really relate because my family came over. They're all here. Yeah way before the war like they were escaping russian pogroms yeah in like the 1840s or whatever right but late 1800s early 1900s sure. so russia was way ahead of the game russia was playing on hard mode yeah i mean my my and your whole family is from russia russia poland ukraine area the USSR, pale the settlement the ussr pale the settlement is zone yeah we don't have exact or at least i don't almost know. no one has exact yeah so you know they're from there. They came. The diaspora is a hell of a trip. Mm -hmm. In the literal sense, too. I mean, all those wagons. 
Yeah. So talk about the Oregon Trail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you ever want to know what the Jewish Oregon Trail is, just watch the last five minutes of Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this isn't an insulting thing or anything. I just found it funny. So Gretel's talking to her new neighbor. She mm -hmm. was an actress and she's like, I love Berlin, she said enthusiastically. I played Sally Bowles there, the perfect city for it. So that's about the musical cabaret, which is about... Um, it's that musical with the Tomorrow Belongs to Me in it, right? Yes. So it's basically about the beginnings of World War II. Now we're on chapter 12. Only how, chapter 12. How many chapters are there? Um, let's see, 40, 20 chapters in the first part, 20 chapters in the second part, and 15 in the third. Okay. Um, okay, if the framing's different, it's because the damn cat knocked the camera over. <laughs> okay, and here we have chapter 12, and her mother's talking to her. It's no longer fiction, Gretel. Tell the story often enough, and it becomes the truth. I get what she's saying here. And she thinks she's going to marry a French guy and they're going to live under assumed names again. And it's kind of the core of this book where Gretel knows she's maintaining this facade. And she knows it's not the truth, but she's trying to still make it the truth, at least of what people know about her. I just find it very difficult to care. Yeah. Like, this all just sounds like more nonsense. Yeah. And in response, she laughs bitterly, and she says, I mean, do you honestly think either of us deserves forgiveness? And, like, she has this idea. She knows that she's complicit, but she never does a damn thing about it. She just lets herself live in the guilt and thinks that's enough. I mean, letting yourself marinate in, like, that is not helpful to anybody. Like, I can understand, like, if you feel guilty about something that, like, you were a participant or, like, a stand bystander in, that's fine. Like, you can have that feeling. But maybe, like, do literally, like, anything. anything. Like, like, oh, you have a lot of money, donate it. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a pet peeve. This is, like, really bothersome. <laughs> so basically, I don't even remember how it comes up, but Gretel's, like, at 90-something. In England, like, oh, I don't understand kilometers. Can you put that in miles? And I'm like, you have lived in Europe pretty much your whole life. You should know kilometers over miles. Yeah, I mean, the Europeans don't use... The Europeans don't use miles. She would not know miles. Like, what the heck is up with that? Who did that? They even use kilometers in freaking Ireland. So why the heck is this even said? Yeah, that's extraneous. It's extraneous, but it bothers me. No, 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 I don't mean you saying it. It just it seems like an odd, no, like... It seems like an odd thing to put in the book at all. Yeah, and, and same again here. This is the first time she's meeting um, this little boy, Henry, who's the son of her new downstairs neighbors. He reminds her a lot of her brother, Bruno. Like, he looks like him and everything. But again, this is extraneous and unnecessary, but it shows a, a fundamental lack of research on Boyne's part. Mm -hmm. um, Bruno, I, I mean, bleh. Henry. Henry, whatever his name is. He mentions he has Harry Potter figures, but Harry Potter action figures. There really aren't any Harry Potter action figures that are for kids. To like play with. To it's play collectibles. With. Yeah. Like I was a huge Harry Potter fan as a kid. We didn't have action figures. We had like wands and shit. <laughs> yeah, like I, I don't get it. And also because he mentions Harry Potter I'm, and he's had transphobic views, I'm gonna guess Boyne's a pretty big fan of J.K. Rowling. Um, like, you think he would have actually done some research, but he's just like, yeah, everything has action figures. Nothing has action figures nowadays except, like, the MCU. Yeah, I mean, like, also action figures are not as big as they once were. That's because they aren't making them. Oh, I don't know anything they about aren't the making industry. No, I'm talking about, like, in general, for kid, for, like, kids' things, mm -hmm. they're just not making merch anymore. Really? Huh. And okay. then they're, comp and then they're canceling shows, because they're like, oh, because, like, a big thing for shows have always- merchandising. Merchandising, and they're like, oh, too many girls are watching this, and girls don't buy merch, but this is a completely different topic that I can rant about another day. Mm -hmm. But yeah, basically, I'm just like, you didn't do your research. Yeah, I mean, like- 
if you're gonna give a kid something to be like a big fan of, like it's way more realistic for a kid to be like, I love sharks. I, no, I mean, I can see him being a fan of Harry Potter, but. Oh, well, no, but I mean like, a lot of the time, like, you know, that thing that your parents buy you, like, not your parents buy you, but the thing that, like, whenever you have a relative who can remember one thing about you, it's, oh, they loved dragons when they were seven. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I guess if you're, if you're nine, like, then Harry Potter's not unreasonable, but it seems as though, No, like, it's nine in, like, 2022. Nine now? I mean, maybe, like, Percy Jackson or something, like, something yeah, a little oh, more- Percy Jackson's way too liberal for him. Yeah. Rick Riordan is, like, a nice person, we can't handle it. Yeah, like this they should have had him reading the boy in the striped pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would I think that would too meta. Yeah. Like it's just supposed to show that he's reading and you know, he's a kid. Also, there's this whole subplot went back when Gretel was a teenager that she she thinks her mother's boyfriend is in love with her. Gross. It doesn't turn out to be that, but like no one really questions or does anything with these pedophilia accusations like it it just seems so weird and random well like if you're gonna have like because i know the mom isn't like a great mom but if you're gonna have like a subplot to see if like like to be like oh it was difficult being a young woman because men are predatory like at least villainize that at least make it like a part of her backstory that's like yeah men are bad yeah that's not really it at all and this is an interesting plot point in the present day. I know we're sounding back and forth, but truly this is how my notes are. Mm -hmm. Well, and also this is how the book is, like. Yeah, so this is chapter 17. She's at her neighbor's, She the, a work man comes in and he notices she has a German accent. Mm -hmm. She hasn't lost it after all these years of pretending. Like a slight, a slight German accent. Like okay. that is what she fears. It's something a lot of people notice. Mm -hmm. It's basically implied he looks to see if she has a tattoo mm -hmm. on her arm. Mm -hmm. And she's like trying to avoid him. And he's like mentioned something like, oh, my grandmother. Oh, sorry. She doesn't recognize her accent. She mentions he's from, Ger she's from Germany. The guy looks for a tattoo. He's from Poland. And he's just like, oh, he tries to bring up something about his grandmother. And Gretel just wants nothing to do with that. Because she's, like, so disinterested in, like, talking about the past. I mean, also, like, they don't She just sense. wants to avoid being known for who she really being is. Being clocked as the daughter of a Nazi. My thing is that, like, I don't think any person who survived would be, like, or who's, like, came, who, whose family came out of the Holocaust would look for a tattoo. It's, like, super invasive. You're like, show me your arm. Yeah, I don't know. I guess he thought because well, she's, also, like, 90-something. Well, or also, like, if you're, like... Being German does not equate to being a Holocaust survivor. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And there's this really confusing part in chapter 18 where she sees a photo mm -hmm. of Emil's brother, mm -hmm. you know, the guy who was in the resistance. And he says, I, I imagine him standing before a firing squad, one arm in the air, even as bullets tore through his young body. And I don't know whether... She's picturing him doing the Nazi salute or what? Because, like, why else would he have his hand in the air like this? I don't know. And I'm like, he was in the resistance, so why are you picturing him as Hitler Youth? Like, this line makes no sense. And then it's basically, we get confirmation that um, the father of the new neighbors downstairs, his name's Alex, mm -hmm. that he's pretty, that he's being abusive to his wife and son. Okay. That's like the main plot of the present day is this guy who's a famous film director. He's he's an asshole who abuses his wife and son. Wait, are these neighbors the Jewish ones? They're not there are no Jewish neighbors. Oh, there's no Jews in this book. There are Jews. I just assume that the neighbors were going to be Jewish. They're not. They're not. Okay. I I, my prediction was that when she found out she was getting neighbors, was that the neighbors were going to be Jewish and that was going to have to have her confront her past. Sure. But it turns out they're not Jewish. She has to confront her past, but just with her little brother. So this is like a coming of age novel for the 90 year old woman situation. Something like that. Huh. The, the neighbors are the dark... Darcy Wicks, but who cares? They're not Jewish. I just kind of thought they might be. 
just because... Because Jews are used as plot devices in other books. So. And in this book, the few Jews that are, their plot devices. And I basically was like, oh, this is going to be her confront having to deal with Jewish people. And this little boy is going to represent Shmuel. And no, it turns out this little boy represents Bruno. And she has to deal with her guilt regarding Bruno's death. You know... I didn't have in my bingo card for this book, Making the Holocaust About You, but I guess I should have, right? I would have put that center space. Sure. The free space. Making the Holocaust About You. <laughs> mm-hmm. She gets to live to 90 and be rich, and she's like, <laughs> go to therapy. Yeah. Okay. And here's finally part one, chapter 20. Okay. We're getting there. Her, her mother shouts at her. Do you want to go to prison? Because that's what would happen. Do you want us both to be dragged to Nuremberg to answer for your father's crime? Do you want to have the eyes of the whole world condemning us, calling us the most terrible names? And like, we've said this, they probably wouldn't have been tried for anything. Yeah, I mean- Because her father had already been hanged, so like what- he had already been like tried and hanged. So, like, what were they gonna do to them? This is very like self victimization. This is like very white woman tears to me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's because like she's. It, I mean, the mom is clearly also a textbook narcissist, but like being afraid of losing her social station, which she has, which she has because her husband is dead and like he's where she got it all from. But like, it's this weird like oh, we're going to get something we don't deserve. But, like, first of all, of course, like, they don't just, they didn't do all the things that her dad did. But you are, like, you deserve to be seen as what you are. Yeah. If someone finds out the truth about you and they think negatively about you, that is your fault. Yeah, and, like, Gretel's like, oh, we're guilty too. And her mom's like, we're not guilty. And it's, like, this whole discussion. Her mom's just like, I was a dutiful wife. And it it's those filthy Jews' fault. All the trouble they caused before the war. Oh my god. Yeah. Here, here's what the mom says. As for those Jews, those filthy Jews, all the troubles they caused before the war, and now all the distress they're causing since it ended. I don't care for politics. You know that. But God in heaven, when you look at what's happening, at the, reven at the revenge they're taking, don't you think that the Fuhrer's case had been proven? These people, your father was right. These are not people at all. And it's just like... You were literally committing genocide. Like, they kind of have a reason to hate you. Well, and, like, bringing up the idea of Jewish revenge, that's an idea uh, that comes from, I believe it's, um, oh, I forget who it is. There's a philosopher, a German philosopher, actually, I think, who wrote about, I think it was Nietzsche, who wrote about uh, the creation of Christianity as Jewish revenge against the atrocities committed against them by the Romans, like, creating a dominant like form of Judaism, which Christianity is not, but like Nietzsche characterized Christianity as Jewish revenge to like create this religion that is dominant in the world when the Jews were so marginalized, which is obviously a wrong idea. Yeah, and I guess it's like her mother was holding these anti-Semitic views all along. Mm -hmm. And like she claimed she didn't know what was happening, but obviously she's okay with it. Well, also like, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I've never been married to a spy. Uh, or anyone who, like, would keep, like, intelligence information, like, that kind of stuff. But, like, if you live, they live next door. They could have been in a sitcom called I Live Next Door to Auschwitz. Like, okay, yeah. Okay, and now here comes the whole part. The climax of, of part one um, in the past is they find out all their neighbors, the man, the man her mom was dating, the boy that um emil yeah emil the boy that gretel was seeing they all knew that they were germans mm -hmm. and they're they're like oh they put them on mock trial that's not a thing that would have ever happened yeah and people would go around speaking their names and told us of their dead loved ones some had some were soldiers that had been captured, members of the resistance who had been brutalized before death, and some had died in the camps. Which, I don't think any of the people there were Jewish, so I feel like that would have been mentioned. But they're basically put on mock trial. They're like, you guys are guilty. You also lied to us. You're filthy Germans. And you think we wouldn't know. And you want to know what their punishment
punishment is. What? Exile? They get their heads shaved. They're like, we don't kill women. And they just shave their heads. And it's shown as this humiliating and painful thing because they don't use like any shaving cream or anything. So it's just like they're- That's what they did to women before, like when they entered the camps. Like Yeah, like, and, and that gets mentioned. And that gets mentioned. Um, the, you know, I thought this would be bananas. I like, have, but I didn't think it would be this bad. Had others done that, I wondered, while I was safely in my house, in that other place playing with my dolls, flirting with Lieutenant Cutler? Had others begged like me, their pleas gone unanswered despite their innocence? So why should mine be heard? Cry me a fucking river. Yeah, and they're like, I don't think there was this whole thing of spies trying to find out whether Germans were hiding in France and stuff. Well, also, like, they were kind of busy. Like, nobody, aside from, like, like prominent Nazis, and they didn't catch all of them. They're still finding them today. Like, the whole idea of, like, oh, like, we were all on the outlook out for, and I'm sure there were hate crimes against German people after yeah, this. Yeah, and I mean, like, they somehow found out their true identities. Do you think we would not know? Do you think that we are not always watching out for strangers with inconsistent histories who might be connected with the devils? That we do not have a network of spies intent on discovering the true identities of anyone we suspect? This, this is, is not, not, this is 1946. You could, you could change your name and hide out and no one would really ever think of anything. Where are we getting this network of spies? Where, where's all the money for this? Where it's like, this is very like, like I know this is probably not intended, but this is very like, the Jews run the government kind of situation of like, we are, our eyes are everywhere. Like, this is 1946, we can't even do this with the internet. There's like telegrams. That is where we're at in terms of technology. Yeah. Okay. People have secret families. Yeah. Yeah, like, it, it's just all bullshit. It makes no historic sense. It's just very self victimizing. Like, well, she now has to go through all the pains that the Jews went through, but it's just still, like, because you were German. And it's, like, not because you were German, because your father was a Nazi. Well, and all of this is self-imposed. They could have just stayed in Germany and been, like, regular people. Like, every, like, it's not like every single, you'd think that if, that if, if, according to this book, every single German person in Germany had their head shaved and all of their, their fathers murdered and, like, what, did they think that Germany is just like a like a black spot in Europe now that it was blown up by like uh, revenge? I don't like, know. I don't know. But basically, after part one, there's you know an interlude, which takes place at some unspecified time, um, and Gretel's in a psych ward. Okay. Um, and she's like, if. Dr. Allen B or whatever her doctor's name is had any concept of what guilt was and she was fooling herself. Guilt was what kept you awake in the middle of the night or if you managed to sleep, poison your dreams. Guilt intruded upon any happy moment whispering in your ear that you had no right to pleasure. Follow you down the streets interrupting the most mundane moments with remembrances of days and hours when you could have done something to prevent tragedy, but chose to do nothing while you play with your dolls or stick pins in maps of Europe, following the army's progression, or flirt with a handsome young lieutenant. Wait, I have a question. She's, she's supposed to be 12 during the events of the, the, book, the first book, right? What 12 year old is flirting with an adult man? The guy's like 19. Oh, I guess that's not terrible. And it's not an adult. He's like 18, 19, so. And, you are 16 going on. And like, I can totally picture a 12 year old having a crush I guess on a 19 year old. A more year old. mature 12 year old. Cause like I was, a, I was like a player. Like they, they go more into this, mm -hmm. but like, it's an obsession of hers. Like this was probably like her first major crush. Okay. But it's also like, probably not as weird of an age gap back then. I mean, yeah, especially like in the thirties and forties, people got married very young. Yeah. So. Although not 12. Yeah. But like, you know, she had a crush on a 19 year old, which not abnormal. I just, I was like a 20, I was assuming he was older, but. No, he was like. He but was I mean, like, like, if you're playing with dolls, you're probably not flirting with older men. <laughs> it's supposed, to, it's supposed to show her as like, oh, I'm An adolescent, yeah. free. Yeah, so it's basically blah, blah, blah. She's in a psych ward. It's an interesting paragraph, but it never really comes up again. 
I don't care about her mental illness. Yeah. Okay. You should feel guilty. Yeah. Okay, part two. Oh, good. Here, again, we get introduced to the husband. This is, like, their first contact with each other. Sure. The abusive husband. The abusive husband and Gretel. And she says, he smiled and looked me directly in the eye. For someone who thinks she has no skills in the acting department, you, my dear, have the one thing every actress needs above all others. I stared at him. And what is that? I asked. The ability to lie. Like, this man is abusive and horrible, but he knows she's lying like five minutes into actually talking with her. Like, five minutes in and he's just like, I don't know what this bitch is lying about, but she's lying about something. Sure, this is a shifty old lady. <laughs> I know we're supposed to think of him as a bad person because he automatically expressed guilt, but I'm like, kind of impressed. I mean, yeah, maybe he's got like some kind of weird Nazi detection thing going on. I don't know, it's just supposed to be like, oh, how could he suspect an innocent lady? But like, he mentions like his thing is like, he writes and directs movies, so he knows when someone's yeah. acting. He can like see character a little bit mm -hmm. more. So, and then we, the skip ahead, skip, skips ahead a few years in terms of Gretel's adolescence. Sure. And teenagerhood. So in chapter two, we find out her mom dies. Her mom had been an alcoholic, so she dies, whatever. And she decides, I need to get out, and she goes to Australia. Sure. And she gets a roommate named Kate. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens for a few chapters until one day she goes to a bar in Australia, and she sees a familiar face, which is Kurt the lieutenant that she had flirted with and had a crush on mm -hmm. back at Auschwitz. And it's just like, okay, that this part I actually found kind of interesting because this is someone who knows about her past. Mm -hmm. And like might recognize her. And yeah. And of course it's like, oh my God, I have to deal with this guy I had a huge crush on when I was like, yeah. I mean, I feel like it's a little different than you and I, or I, like, at the post office running into, like, a teenage crush. I'm like, oh, this is the person Yeah, who like, they're both from. hiding. They're both in hiding. Yeah. Okay, and this is just a line I found hilarious. This is in chapter five of the book. She's talking with someone, I forget who. She's talking about the top floor of her building. Mm -hmm. And basically, she's like, an award-winning win novelist and a prominent literary critic live across the hall from each other, writing for each other's displeasure. That's kind of funny. That's funny, and I'm like, I would much rather read a book about that. I'd like to read a book about, like, two crotchety old men. Yeah, like, I, I would, like, two crotchety old men, or I'm thinking, like, you know, an, an enemies to lovers kind of thing. Two middle-aged people. One of them is a critical, like, is a critical novelist. The other one, like, like, a, like, a very successful, but like, kind of critically panned. And the other one is like, this is commercial drivel. And then they like realize their neighbors and fall in love, and they have like grown-up children, and it's like a whole thing. Yeah, like that would actually be an interesting concept. Yeah, very America sweethearts. I mean, I would much prefer- There's so many more interesting side characters in this book. Yeah, and that's the only time they get mentioned, but I'd rather read that than, like, you know, 300 some odd pages I'd of Nazi read, apologia. I'd rather read the phone book. And this is also something that bothers me. Like, she says that someone made inverted comma symbols in the air, and I'm like, do you mean air quotes? Do they call them inverted commas in England? I don't think so. Maybe he used that as a placeholder because he didn't remember what air quotes were called, and then he just never fixed it. Maybe. And, okay. Skip ahead, skip ahead, because nothing really happens. Interesting in Chapter 6. In Chapter 7, she has to go get Henry, the neighbor boy from school, because his mom's overdosed or something. No, sorry, she hasn't overdosed yet. She's just like, I can't pick him up from school, blah, blah, blah. Can you go? Just and a random neighbor woman. It's the only neighbor she's close with. Oh, they're close? Not close, but like it's the only one she's really talked to. Fair enough. So like trustworthy enough. Plus yeah. she's like a 90 year old woman. What's she gonna do? Take the boy to get some bubble gum? Yeah, so she's- As far so, as they know, she's harmless. Yeah, so his mother's like, hey, can you go and get Henry from school? I can't do that. And she's 
while she's waiting for Henry, she's looking at photos on the wall of the school. The quiet of the school was replaced with, by the sounds of tra trains arriving late at night. The cries of boys and girls being separated from their parents. And that other boy, the boy I had only met once, I had encountered when he was stealing a set of clothes. He begged me not to report him. He'll kill me, he had said. I asked him who he was referring to, and he looked at Kurt. I had never seen such terror as I had seen in those boys' eyes. And she's having like this PTSD flashback. And, like she's like, who would kill a child? And, you know, that little boy turns out to be Shmuel. Of course. Because of course. And this is an interesting part. She's like, yes, that was it, Shmuel. A name that sounds like wind blowing. Does it? Shmuel. Maybe to Germans? I don't know if wind but sounds that's different all, in Germany. But that's all we really get of Shmuel. He doesn't get any more characterization, really. I mean, it sounds as though he just wanted to tie it in to, like, give her a connection to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we get confirmation that the man that Gretel has seen is in Kurt. the bar is indeed Kurt. And he draws a fence on some newspaper. And then he leaves. Like, to indicate to her, like, I know you were at the camps too or something? We'll get to that. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. So, part two, chapter 10. We find out Gretel's roommate, Kate, is gay. Like, she, they had been talking about, like, what secrets they had had. And Gretel wakes up one morning and there's a strange woman. And the, they were hooking up. They were hooking up. And Gretel's like, I thought about it. I, I, I had never known any woman or man for that matter who was interested in romantic relationships with people of the same sex. But I found to my surprise that I didn't much care. It all seemed so trivial compared to the traumas we had survived over the last 13 years. Like, I can excuse anti-Semitism, but homophobia is where I draw the line. Like, she doesn't like Jews, but she's okay with gay people. <laughs> Homophobia is you can excuse anti-Semitism. It's like Shirley in that. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Like, I, I just think it's so funny. Like, good for you for doing the bare minimum. Like, also, like, like because Kate's like, oh, I have a. C throughout this whole thing, she's been like, I have a secret. I am seeing you have a secret. We all have our secrets, and she, of course, like Kate can actually legitimately be killed for hers. Well, for women in the in the past, it was a lot less common for them to just be like. To be well, because it was so thought, so I thought of as so like unheard of that a woman would have any kind of sexual drive at all. So like the idea of relations between women was just not considered for men like, to be accused of homosexuality was basically a death sentence or like an exile for like in the, is the example of Oscar Wilde. But like generally speaking, like it was just kind of assumed like oh they were roommates, they were great friends. Like the reason that stereotype exists is because women were thought of as being sexless beings aside from when they're activated by a man. Mm -hmm. But wow, I mean, living is kind of openly homosexual in Australia in like the 50s. That was a bit interesting. This character's more interesting. <laughs> Why does he keep writing all these semi-interesting side characters? Yeah, and he's second to screen time. And in the next chapter, which of course takes place in the present, he mentions the pandemic, which just seems unnecessary. And then he has this line where Gretel is thinking about all her past daughter-in-laws. Because mm -hmm. she's meeting her son's newest fiance. Sure. And she's like, I admitted, for there was no question that, that the woman was in excellent shape, although she car carried a little extra upholstery, can we say, in the chest area. I wondered whether that was what had attracted my son to her. Men can be rather shallow in these things, I've always found. And I'm sure it was no coincidence that my previous daughters in law were all equally blessed in the bosom department. Like, why are we talking about boobs? Well, also, like, I understand that Gretel, whether or not he wants to depict her that way, is a very weird and critical person who clearly either doesn't love her son or doesn't have the ability to love him. But, like, if the thing that you're critical of, like, oh, is she in good shape? And what's her tit situation like? Like, I've almost, like, a few members of my family comment on my bust, but, like, it's not like 
they're like the first thought they have about me like i'm not an object to them <laughs> yeah okay it's like so, breasting boobily like <laughs> okay <laughs> we couldn't get through a holocaust book without <laughs> breasting boobily and he's gay so like why are we talking about boobs i'm glad that we're not drinking through this because by now it would be not on the under the table but on top of it <laughs> And okay, so now, chapter 12, we're back to her in Australia, and she's wondering about Kurt. I pictured him eating lunch with his colleagues, laughing at their stories, and returning home to his wife, leading an entirely normal life, without any thought for who or what he did. Did he sleep well at night, or did he have nightmares like me? I was sure he had convinced himself of his innocence in the same way I tried to do. How well had he succeeded? And the thing is, I don't think she realizes that Kurt probably doesn't feel any guilt because he thought he was doing the right thing. Well, most, a lot, the, the, the cliche is I was just following orders. Like that's the... Yeah, I think he says that, but he also knows that's BS and he just doesn't care that what he was doing. Well, <laughs> I have not read a lot of accounts of like former German soldiers. Like the way he's portrayed in this book, it's like... He's just like, I was doing what I was supposed to do. Now I'm living my life. Yeah. And also, this is such a funny line. Like, she stalks him, follows him to his house. Mm -hmm. His son is, you know, on a swing. And there's like a white picket fence or whatever. I don't know what kind of fence. But it's like, why did it frighten me so that fences like this I knew existed all over the world? Like, she, not to make fun of phobias because they're very real thing but and her getting crazy. so freaked out over like a white picket fence is just hilarious like i don't think that either of us like think trauma is a not important thing like we're both very aware of it but like it's there are a lot of things to be afraid of in this situation and the fence to me i mean unless she like sees all fences as symbolic of the camps which didn't traumatize her at all but she was like there are farms like yeah okay and then you know we go back to the present day and she's wondering a little bit about her past. Her son mentions that she had grown up in Berlin and was in Poland for a bit, but they don't really, but he doesn't know the truth. At least she thinks he doesn't. And it finally crosses her mind, like, like during this conversation that he may have asked her husband. Oh, and, and he knew the truth. The hus so the husband was aware. Yes. So we don't know how much Caden, her son, knows about his mother. But, like, we don't know if he ever finds out the truth. And we find out that Caden and his dad, they had visit Auschwitz at some point right before the father died. And Gretel's just, like, horrified at this. Especially since Caden didn't bring it up until now and his father has been dead for a while now. Sure. Blah, blah, blah. And then, for some reason... Gretel has like this total breakdown and she goes to her future daughter-in-law and she's like, there's nothing I could have done, I told her. Don't you see that even if I had wanted to, that would have been impossible. And she <laughs> doesn't know what, what, and what so Gretel like, was all of this lady is losing it. <laughs> and she's asking for forgiveness from people she didn't hurt and who weren't affected. She's looking for in all the wrong places. All the broken places. Cut to credits. I wish. It's still going on. Yeah. Okay, so now Australia, she's talking to his wife and he's like, she's like, oh yes, he was a conscientious objector. He got out of the country just as the war broke out. He hated Hitler and all those terrible men. And Gretel's like, I didn't blame him for denying his past, but it was entirely another thing to present himself as kind of a hero. But also, I can't really tell with the wife whether she's, like, actually believes or whether, like, I mean, like, whether she believes it or not, because she also mentions, I think Hitler is still alive, which is a very Nazi thing. Well, yeah, there's just, like, there was the conspiracy theory that he was, like, gonna rise up again or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's not really important. What's important is, is that the mom goes inside and Gretel just straight up kidnaps his son. What? <laughs> She just straight up kidnaps the kid. What does she do? Basically tries to do a murder-suicide. She she brings the son to her house and she's just like, I'm not really sure how I'm, 
and she's just like, okay, he'll fall asleep and then I'll fall, I'll take him down to the kitchen I'll, and I'll turn up the gas stove and we'll both die. This woman is deeply unstable. Yeah, it was a strange, liberating feeling knowing the end was in sight. I felt relieved, but frightened too. I didn't know whether I believed in heaven, but I knew I believed in hell. After all, I had lived there once. Ah. Uh, yeah. I see it, like, assume that there's like a deep primal scream inside of me right yeah. now. Yeah, like she just straight up kidnaps the kid. And you wanna know what she does? What? Well, well, and now we're back to the present day and she's like to her new daughter-in-law, whose name is Eleanor, she's like, she just tells this whole story to her and Eleanor is just like, oh, okay, I guess I can understand kind of what you did. Like she doesn't go into total details, but she's like, yeah, I once kidnapped the kid and I almost killed him and myself. I mean, if you're having a psychic break, there are certain things that I understand, but I don't think that that's a thing that you just dump on your new daughter-in-law. Like, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a special case. Yeah. And it's just like, of course she doesn't kill him or herself. What happens? So the next day she goes to meet Kurt at, at a cafe. She leaves the kid with her roommate. And when they first meet, he automatically recognizes her and he tries to speak in German. I don't really know what he says. Look, I tried running it through Google Translate and I came up with like, you may not believe it, but I have guessed what you have always wanted. Something like that. But they talk, they catch up. He's like, haha, remember how your brother used to call it out twith? Which still doesn't make sense because they didn't speak English. Yeah. And Kurt's like, oh, yes, I drew the fence. It always felt to me like a symbol of that time. One that any of us who are on either side of the fence would remember. Like, he didn't know. Really this is not like the Berlin Wall where, like, everybody's a victim. Like, yeah, so he thought, he wasn't sure at first who she was until she he got the note that she had left at his house. Mm -hmm. But he's like, oh, it could have been a Nazi hunter or whatever. But, like, I'm just going to draw a fence. And then, you know, they're discussing guilt and stuff. And he's like, I was just, what is the word? An accomplice. A teenage boy playing dress up, enjoying the power that had somehow landed in my lap. Your father was a monster. I was just the monster's apprentice. It makes me think that like he, he doesn't feel guilty, not because he was just following orders, but because he actually enjoyed what he was doing. Yeah. I mean, there are people who like, I would excuse that. And I mean, this is especially true because he pulls out of his pocket a set of glasses mm -hmm. and he's like, oh, these are Hitler's glasses. And it's just like, I don't, that doesn't seem realistic either, but okay. Yeah, like he has, um, did Hitler wear glasses? I have no fucking idea. And um, then he's like to Gretel, your father was the commandment of the most notorious concentration camp of them all. And you've chosen not to present yourself to the authorities in the years between liberation of that camp and today. Every tiny piece of information could provide some relief to the families of those. And he stops himself and bit his lip. You can pretend otherwise, Gretel, but you, like me, are what's called a person of interest. And they would surely find some way of suggesting that you were guilty as any of us, no matter how young we were. That's not true. Like, he would definitely be blamed. Because I mean, he was a soldier. The thing is that, like, most, um, like, most most people who, like, were in the army didn't get, like, life in prison or, like, in No, but he was like, also, like, the assistant to the most powerful. Well, but, like, especially if he were young, they probably would have, like, been lenient with him. Yeah. She was a child. A child of, like, a Nazi, but still a child. Like, at the very least, they might have been, like, will you turn state's evidence? And if she said no, they would have been, like, okay, be on your way then. Yeah, like, they have this whole thing. Like, they were gonna, this whole horrible thing, and it's just, like... Baby. He needs comfort. He's providing me comfort in my difficult time. I love you, Biblin. And she's like, yeah, I could have told the authorities all of this, but I just didn't. Well, and the thing is that, like, th this is also contradictory because she's saying she knew nothing, but also that she didn't tell the authorities anything is, like, a cardinal she, she, sin. No, like, she didn't know anything during the war, but, like, afterwards, when she knew everything, she could have gone and told people. Well, but like, what inside information would she have had? I don't know. If, like, she's so innocent and didn't know anything that was going on during, she wouldn't have had to know anything. anything yeah, else. and again, 
she's putting all her responsibility of turning herself in onto others. But also, like, she's not, like, who is she to turn herself into? Hi, I'm related to a Nazi. So is everybody. Yeah, and then he's like, it was, it was their generation that started it and ours that paid. Like, I don't even know what that means. And that's not true either. Like, there were, there, it wasn't just like 70 year olds or whatever who ran the whole, like, Third Reich. There were lots of young Nazis who are still alive today. Yeah, and he's just like, if I was ever caught, I would just say, I was a boy of just 19. Mm, 19 is I'd been I'd been indoctrinated. I had been forced to join the Hitler Youth. I knew nothing about what was happening. I simply did. And that's just... I've said it once. I've said it a thousand times. Having a Nazi phase is not a cute quirk from your youth. Like, and also, like, 19 is old enough to know better. Yeah. Unfortunately, Kurt, the Nazi, also makes a really good point. Oh, the worst person you know has made a point? Because it's not how we're designed. It starts in the schoolyard, where small boys are fighting amongst each other. In the 1940s, the Jews were the right people to hate. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking the wrong thing. Um, this is not a good point. Now, 10 years later, it's us who are hunted down. When they discover one of us, they bring us to a courtroom so the world can hear of our crimes. But all they want is to kill us in any way they can. What the fuck? Yeah. So he is comparing the plight of the Jews, who are blamed for everything wrong with Germany and then systematically murdered, to the plight of Nazis, who did the systematic murdering. Like, does he think that they're trying to holocaust the Germans? Because I can promise him it didn't happen. If he needs to be reassured, Germany is still very much there. My uncle lives in Germany. <laughs> yeah. And then he, he's, like, trying to guilt Gretel and stuff. Like, you saw what happened, and you just played with your dolls. Because she was a child? Mm-hmm. What was she supposed to do? Go to the New York Times? <laughs> and he's like, if you, if you, and if you do tell, your life will no longer be your own. Do you th really believe that your father's one surviving child will be absolved of all responsibility? Within days, your photograph will be on the front page of every newspaper across the planet. And believe me, they'll be far more interested in you than they are in me. They'll talk for me about for a while, but they'll write books about you. And that's what you've always wanted, isn't it? For you and me to be linked in some way. Yeah, and then he gets creepy and he's like, I could have done things to you back then, but I didn't because I'm a decent person. I'm just a Nazi. I'm not a pedophile. I, I, I can excuse Nazism, but I draw a line in pedophilia. You can excuse Nazism? And again, she tries to abdicate her responsibility. She writes a letter to Kurt's wife about her and all about Kurt's past and she's like do with this information what you will and of course nothing ever happens and she's like well if no one else turned me in then like maybe it's okay Jesus H Christ and now finally we're back to interlude number two so we're done with part two Sam can we be done with being alive <laughs> sorry and she's like I feel like you can slowly see me wilting as the video goes yeah, on. Yeah, and she basically explained she didn't get the same indoctrination. Like, she wasn't a part of these youth groups because she was at Auschwitz. So she wasn't around any other girls. So she couldn't have been part of a youth group. So she didn't have, like, the same level of, like... Which also doesn't make sense because, once again, of, due to her father's position, he'd be grooming them to take over. Well, my question is, why was the family stationed at Auschwitz? Wasn't, why wasn't the father just, like, sent away to do work there and they live back at home in Berlin? That seems like what they did, right? Like, they didn't usually I, have their families on base. I don't know. Base. I don't know. If they had kids. Yeah, and she's just like, we had both spent much of our time since arriving trying to figure out what we were doing there. But then don't be weird. I'm not... I'm what like... the purpose of this place was and what, when we might be allowed to leave. And it's just it's like, what? And her father continues to be an anti-Semitic asshole. Like, he brings her into the camp to, like, show her around. And she's like, you he's like, you must never be frightened of this place. The world is being reborn here. Think of it as somewhere that sick animals are bought to be put down so they can no longer be a threat to decent men and women. Cool. Cool. He goes to take, like, a phone call or whatever, and she... So we're vermin. 
And then she goes, she finds like a closet full of uniforms with yellow stars and pink triangles. And she's like, why everyone was forced to dress the same? Where are the clothes they arrived in? And it's like, they're giving her the same thoughts as Bruno. She's 12 years old. She's supposed to be more mature. She's, she's supposedly already know, but she's just like, what's going on? Once again, like reasserting this myth of German ignorance. Yeah, and then this is where she meets Schmuel. For like a minute. For like a minute. And he, you know, they have a small conversation. And he's like, I'll never be 12. His word sends a chill through my body. Why shouldn't you be 12? We all turn 12 at some point, And he would too. I was certain of it. And he's just like, he knows he's going to die. Schmuel is aware of what's happening. Yeah, Shmuel is more aware of what's happening. Are Jewish kids just more perceptive? They're like kids in the sixth sense. <laughs> they know things more. <laughs> and she's like, nonsense. No one would let a child your age die. And this is where it gets worse. I, I told him, we're winning the war. When we win, everything will return to normal. Only it will be a better normal than it ever was before. Like, she does not understand that he is not supposed to be a part of this. The, the better normal. Yeah, and that, like... Tomorrow does not belong to Shmuel. No, like, Shmuel's just, like... Shmuel's uh, collateral damage. Yeah, Shmuel's like, I'm not German. We're not winning this war. They're acting... She's acting like they're on the same side. And it's just really weird. And this is even the worst part. Like, she notices the uniforms and everything, and he, she figures out that Shmuel and Bruno have been friends and have been talking. And she finds out that Shmuel doesn't know where his father went. So she's like, so she goes to Bruno and she's like, hey, why don't you help your friend look for his dad? You can go under the fence and get into a uniform and help him look for his dad. So she, and, and that's that, not in the original book. No. So in this one, it makes her directly responsible for Bruno's dad. So it dad. retcons in in order to give her some trauma to work through. Yeah. Ugh. I'm emotional. And she, she gives him the idea to go under the fence, and she's just like, I meant it as a joke. I thought it'd be funny, and then he ends up dead. Okay, and now we're on to part three, the final solution. I gotta say, just as a, this is the worst accidental child death that I've heard about in a while. <laughs> Here we are. Mm, I think this is chapter one. And she's, like, talking to Alex, the abusive husband, and she's like, my dear man. I have witnessed fear in ways you cannot imagine. In your wildest dreams, in the most vivid fantasies of the cinematic entertainments you throw together, you could never, you could not even come close to understanding the traumas I've seen. Do you have any idea what fear is? I'm sorry to say that I, kn I know more than most ever will. I mean, like, she doesn't get to be like high and mighty over this, like, like. Again, all these people are standard, all the people in the modern world are like standard variety asshole or domestic abuser, which like is bad, but isn't like Nazi bad, not that we're like comparing badness. Like, why is she all high and mighty about like seeing bad stuff when I, supposedly she would, didn't know anything at all? Yeah, and then he's like, he's trying to figure out her secret and he's like, then he's like, I'm sure I'll be able to track it down. You strike me as an interesting woman, Mrs. Fernsby. Someone who is not entirely honest with the world. As a filmmaker and storyteller, that intrigues me. What, like, abusive asshole guy who's, like, I assume a pretty successful director is interested in the 90-year-old neighbor? I don't know. I mean, maybe he's trying to get her to back... I, I get it if, like, she was providing support for his wife and so he wanted her to back off. But he could just threaten her. He doesn't have to, like, be interested. 90-year-old German women aren't, like, that difficult to come by. Like, they have them. Yeah. So, now she's going off. She's like... Okay, no policemen have shown up after I sent that letter to Kurt's wife. So I'm just going to get out of Australia. Cool. What was the point of this? Nothing. There was no point. It was just mainly so she could confront Kurt and everything. Mm -hmm. And so blah, blah, blah. She ends up getting a job. Mm -hmm. She's working, you know, at a clothing store. And she's like helping with the finances. Mm -hmm. And then one day she runs into her boss and here's what happens. I notice the tattoos upon her arm and rear my seat back in fright. Moments like this appearing unexpectedly have the power to distress me greatly. 
I felt as if they had been sent by, from God to remind me that I could experience peace and happiness in my daily life, but I should never forget my part in the horror, for my culpability was scarred deeply into my soul as those numbers were upon Miss Erickson's arm. Wow, this evidence of the Holocaust is super traumatic for me, a person who didn't have any pain associated with it in my personal life. When this person was in a camp, she's just, a, she's just a, like a plot device. This woman has nothing. Yeah, and also the fact that she's working in the finance department kind of bothers me. Yeah. Just because of the stereotype. And she has, she's not given really any personality or anything. She's just a person to be there. Yeah. To, ha to be a Holocaust survivor. Yeah. And here's where I'm pretty sure the whole... I, where I'm convinced that um, Moyne is buddy buddy with J.K. Rowling. This book she, is a rich is a rich text full of bad points. <laughs> so this is basically said by the guy she's currently sleeping with. Now she's in England. Mm -hmm. Sleep with any consenting adult that will have you. That's what I say, and that's basically taken verbatim from that infamous J.K. Rowling tweet, where she's like, she says, "Sleep with any consenting adult who will have you. Call yourself whatever you like." This like trans affirming language that's basically just like i don't believe in pronouns and you are a bigot for telling me to be nice to you yeah basically and so the guy she's sleeping with is named david and she ends up talking with his friend edgar who is who she ends up marrying and he's like you know david's jewish right did she not notice he was circumcised because circumcision didn't used to be as common as it is now I don't know. It still isn't common in Europe. And she, he's like, oh yeah, David's faced all this discrimination. The war didn't help. Reading about what happened afterwards, the concentration camps and so on, got people's backs up. And the fact that it's always on the news now, so many people looking for answers. And she's just like, never figured that David was Jewish. And she's like, if I had not been so utterly stupid, so ignoring so ignorant of the world, I would have realized this from the start from his name alone. But it simply never occurred to me. I had only been focusing on my attraction to him and the pleasures he gave me in bed. I mean, there are lots of non-Jewish Davids. David Cameron, for example. But his last name is Ro Rotharam. That's Jewishy. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, lots of people have non-Jewish last names who are Jewish. I mean, yeah, you, me. I mean, my name's a fake Ellis Island name, but comes from Finkelstein, actually. <laughs> but like, w also like, why does it matter to her? It's so dumb. Like, like, okay, you're sleeping with a Jewish guy, get over it. We've all done it. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're like, hey, come with us to this movie. It's about the Holocaust. I feel like that's a, a question you ask when you know someone really, really well. Yeah, and he's like, her husband, uh, her future they husband. They're not married yet. No, no, no. This She's is, dating his friend. Yeah. He's like, oh, I love history. And David's like, I just want to see Nazis dead. Which, fair. Yeah, I mean, same. David sounds like a cool dude. <laughs> and, it's like, number. <laughs> and it's like, it's a fake film. It's called Darkness. I looked it up. It doesn't exist. And it talks all about, like, how it started. The invalidation of all the passports. Their subsequent stamping with the letter J, Kristallnacht, the invasion of Poland. And it's like, she would have seen all this. She would have experienced it. She was there. She was there. She sees images of Jews being rounded up and put on the trains. Why are we in a Holocaust exhibit? Why are we at the Holocaust Museum in this book? <laughs> David is crying. And then she has a memory of the, the filmmakers where this, where these clips had come from coming. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden during this movie, she hears her father's voice. Yikes. And then there's a picture of them all having dinner. Before an audience of a thousand or more, my entire family was seated around the dinner table. Father, mother, my brother, and myself. All four of us raising a toast to our beloved Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. And the camera pans slowly from one of us to the next, first father appearing proud and patriarchal, then mother, beautiful, serene, exhibiting an aura of calm, then me, I was sitting up straight, reveling in the attention, looking beyond the camera, where if I remember correctly, Kurt was watching, observing the scene as it played out. She was wondering 
if, you know, David or Edgar would recognize her, even though it had been 11 years and she's afraid of them recognizing her. And here's like a bad part. Then, as if from nowhere, I heard a low keening sound like an animal caught in a trap. It was a horrifying, inhumane sound that no living creature should make. It appeared to be coming from somewhere nearby, and to my surprise, I noticed people turning to look in my direction. The sound was coming from me, emerging from the very depths of me as I stared at the screen and observed the cheerful face of my beloved younger brother, quietly eating his dinner, his eyes glancing up from time to time, trying not to laugh at the camera. So she runs out after this, after seeing her brother, and throws herself in front of a bus. I mean, not an unreasonable thing to do. Right, but like, she doesn't get sad or, or feel anything really until her brother comes on screen. Yeah, I mean, she should have probably felt something about the other stuff. Skip a chapter, whatever. It's revealed that her boyfriend David is an orphan from Czechoslovakia. He, he was raised by his grandparents because his parents and sister didn't make it out in time. And she's like, oh, I never knew that. And she just never thought about his family being involved in the Holocaust. She assumed he was English. And now in the present day, she receives a mysterious package. It contains a book called The Final Solution, Hitler's plans to exterminate the Jews. And she finds out it's from her, the husband downstairs, Alex. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, I thought this might bring up some happy memories for you. Are we supposed to not be rooting for him to terrorize her? Exactly. Like, this guy is abusive, who's, who, by the way, I haven't mentioned, like, basically threatened to kill his wife and kid. Sure. Like, standard like, abuser. like, like, standard like, abuser. Like, he's been hurting them, physically abusing them, and then he's like, oh, yes, I'm... If anything happens, I'm gonna pour gasoline on you and light you guys on fire. But it's like, see what I mean by like, this book had me rooting for an abuser. Yeah, the vibes are very negative. She obviously wakes up in a hospital and she finds out she's pregnant. With David's baby. Yes, she's pregnant with a Jewish boy's baby. I don't like it. And then she's like, okay, if we're going to go through this, through with this, I have to tell him the truth. And he's like, Gretel, there's nothing you can say to me that will make me not want to be with you. There are things I need to share too, about my past, about my family. I'll tell you my story and you can tell me yours. After that, we can start afresh, begin our new lives together. How does that sound? And at this point, he doesn't know she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. She finds out that David had lied a little about his family. At first he had told Edgar that, oh yes, my sister was getting her appendix out so my parents wanted to wait till she was better. And they didn't make it in time when in reality his sister was supposed to perform a piano recital and his parents wanted her to perform and then they would get out. Why would you lie about that? Because it feels like, you know, oh, it's my parents' fault. It's trivial too, yeah, okay trivial and like well so it's not a very good story yeah and everyone's dead so who can confirm it yeah i'm not gonna police a holocaust survivor yeah and then he's like i still dream of them he said smiling a little through his grief i see dream he added but of course i mean i have nightmares i'm there with them naked in the gas chamber burning in the fires i don't even feel human in those dreams but that's how they made us feel isn't it like we weren't people at all and like during this, she's like, oh, please don't tell me, please don't tell me. And he, he's just like, I find it hard to talk about any of this, about these people, about what, what they did. I want them all dead. They're so out there, you know, in Europe, in South America, in Australia. So many of them awaiting justice. Sometimes I think that's how I should spend my life, hunting them down. My problem is, is that I still love you, he said. And it seemed he found it torturous to admit that this is not your fault. So your father was like, I don't know, some humble functionary in an office somewhere. What else could he have done? I can't blame you for that. So she had told a little bit of her past that she was from Germany. Sure. And at this point, he thinks that her dad is like an office worker for the Reich or whatever. Yeah. And then he's talking in hypotheticals, like you need to tell me everything. I can't live with secrets to your lies. It's like, what are we going to tell if 
our children if we ever have them. And she's like, why would we have to tell them the truth? She ends up telling him more of the truth. Um, he was a senior officer. Of course, I was just a child. I knew very little about what he did on a day-to-day -day basis. The war was going on. He was really at home, but it didn't seem to affect us very much. And then one day, my brother and I came home from school and we were surprised to find Maria, our family's maid, who always kept her head bad and never looked up from the carpet, standing in my brother's room, pulling all of his belongings out of his wardrobe and packing them into wooden crates, even the things he had hidden in the back, which he had told me belonged to him and were nobody's business. And those are like the opening lines of the boy in the striped pajamas, so it seems really weird that she would say that. Also weird and, that she remembers all this years and years later. Well, after this is trauma her, and like this is her like eleven years later. Oh, okay. But yeah, this is her in as, as a young adult. Yeah, like she's talking with David. She's like nineteen, mm -hmm. and she's like, "Yeah, I also still miss my dad. If I could have him back, even for a day, even if I could just talk to him for an hour." But it's just very weird that she has this whole speech. Mm -hmm. Then we go ahead to the present. Chapter 13, Alex comes up to her and he tells her all these names that she's gone by in the past. And here he employed the surname I had been born with, my father's infamous name and the one I had not used since mother and I had boarded the train to Paris from Berlin in 1946. So we still don't know what her name is. Oh, we never find out. Mm -hmm. So and what happens with David? It gets a little confusing, but he asks, what are you? Are you even human? I'm Gretel, I told him, desperate to believe I had not lost his love. The same Gretel who you fell in love with. And you, he asked, did you care? I thought about it. There was no point in lying. No, I said. No, I didn't. Not then. Even when he took you there, he asked. When you saw what was going on, I was 12. That's old enough to know the difference between freedom and imprisonment, he replied, standing up. Between hunger and starvation, between life and death and right and wrong. But you did nothing. Well, by doing nothing, you did everything. By taking no responsibility when you know what you're a part of. And she's like, please forgive me. I can promise to do better. And then he's like, if you think I would ever touch you again, then you're just as mad as your father was. I don't want to be in the same city as you, Gretel. Don't you understand? Let alone the same room. Yeah, I mean, fair. Yes. And it turns out he moves to America and never finds out that Gretel was pregnant. And she marries Edgar. She marries Edgar and David, of course, tells Edgar everything, which I don't understand why they're friends because Edgar at this time also still has the toothbrush mustache. Like, So Edgar is like a Nazi sympathizer. I don't think he's a Nazi sympathizer, but like he finds out about Gretel's path and he's just like, yeah, whatever. I mean, the thing is that like to any like other person, I feel like it wouldn't be that much of an insult, but like, he shared the most intimate part of himself romantically, history-wise, with her, and she was lying to him all the time, the whole time. Yeah. Like, the thing is, like, he's not, like, it's not that she should, like, she's not culpable for her father's actions, but, like, she is a bad person and she shouldn't have lied to him. Yeah. But, and so she, David tells Edgar, she also tells Edgar, she gives him all the information, she's like, give it to the police, publish it in the newspaper, I don't care. Again, putting the responsibility on everyone else. Oh my gosh, how many times is she going to write her last confession? I don't know, but David's pretty much, you've added to my nightmares, you've done the impossible, they'll never go away, burning hell. So he goes to America and eventually she's like, okay, I'm going to give this baby up for adoption. Mm -hmm. And the family's like, oh, that's so nice of you. You can name the baby. And twist. She names it Bruno? No, the baby is actually her neighbor. Oh. That neighbor that who is, who has dementia, Heidi. Is her baby. Is her baby. And Heidi never knows this. She's adopted. She's lived her whole life in this building. But she oh, never- Oh, so she doesn't marry Edgar until after she gives the baby up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she gives up the baby. I assumed that her son was, was David's son no 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 that she has him like 10 years later okay but no it's not david's god son. this is so emotionally exhausting i need like a clonopin <laughs> yeah like she gives 
birth to a baby girl and she's like, okay, I can't keep this. And so she gives it up and she, and it's why she cares so much for her neighbor. It's because it's his, it's her daughter. Sure. But of course, Heidi never learns anything about her past. It's a shitty thing to do. Yeah. So Heidi never knows the truth. And it's why she's so patient with this. Somehow this turned into a Nazi Jew romance. I hate being alive. Yeah. And here is where Alex, again, the abusive husband, has a great point. Okay, what's he said? If it hadn't been him, her father, it would have been someone else, he said. The Holocaust didn't begin and end with your father. Don't overestimate his influence. Yeah, I mean, it was a whole country of people who decided that Jewish contamination was the source of all their problems and not a lot of other things, and the world is maybe complicated. Yeah, and then she... And then he tries to justify Bruno's existence, like, uh, not Bruno's, sorry, Schmuel's, because she's like, there are a few children there, and I was surprised to see Schmuel because for Mer cause some kids were there for medical experimentation in there, and Bellina is trying to retroactively make his mis correct his mistakes, blah, blah, blah. But none of this really matters. She's like, I have terrible secrets. I've been partially responsible for the death of who knows how many people, and I certainly feel responsible for the death of my brother. How am I supposed to atone for any of that? And she, you know, she's with this guy who's abusive, and she's like thinking of his son as her little brother, because mm -hmm. he reminds her that. So she just straight up kills him. She kills the abuser? How? She's 90. Um, with a box cutter I just like slice yeah this is such a weird book yeah he really got away from the editor didn't he mm -hmm. i slit his throat with a box cutter and dragged his body into the spare room i imagine i'll have to deal with the consequences relatively soon as it'll only be a day or two before he starts to smell but i wanted to get through today first i knew Caden would never quite forgive me no, has never quite forgiven me for skipping his last wedding. And then she's like, ironically, I did become the most famous woman in England for a while. Like, he threatened to, like, out me in my past, but it's not every day that a 92-year-old lady of comfortable means slits the throat of a sexual film producer and then gets two nights of sleep, good sleep, and then offers herself into custody. She turns herself in for murdering him, but her past never comes out. She gets sentenced to a low security women's prison, like so much so that she can bring in shit from home. Like a sure. And she's just like, you know, the food is terrible and I can't have wine, but you know, it's not so horrible. And I try and say I'm sorry every night, but you know, she has this picture of her in her jewelry box and like she's examining it and she has her jewelry box in prison and she like notices all these little details for the first time mm -hmm. and including her brother on a swing. Last word of the novel is her brother's name, Bruno. She's like, of all the men, of all the boys I've loved, like I miss him the most. I loved him the most. And that's the end of the book. I hope this makes sense to people. Uh, I probably should have been clear on the chapters and everything. I mean, Who people cares? get the gist. Yeah. This book is so nonsensical that, like, I don't know that anything could make it make sense. I mean, do you feel like you understand it even now? I understand it. I don't like it. Fair enough. And I just want to talk about the author's note. Sure. He says... I first conceived of the idea for All the Broken Places in 2004, shortly after completing the final draft of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, and I knew immediately I would write it one day. For years, I kept a file on my computer titled Gretel's Story, in which I would make notes about Bruno's older sister, who she might become later in life, and the experiences that might shape her adulthood. And I don't totally believe this. And he just goes with a lot of bullshit. He's like, this novel is about guilt, complicity, and grief and how culpable a young person might be given the historical events unfolding around her and whether a person can ever cleanse themselves of crimes committed by the people she left. This is like whatever the opposite of critical race theory is. 
Yeah. It's failing to criticize race theory. And he's like, I've always been fascinated by the Holocaust. But he doesn't do any research. He's fascinated by the Holocaust the way a child was fascinated with fire. Hmm. And she's, he's like trying to excuse himself. Gretel is replete with flaws and contradictions. He's capable of moments of great kindness and acts of appalling cruelty. And I hope the reader will think about her long after finishing the book, perhaps questioning what they might have done in her place. After all, it is easy when one is far removed from a historical episode to claim one would not have acted as others did, but it is far more difficult to show basic humanity in the moment. Counterpoint, no, actually. There were a lot of very brave Germans who did not. Not to mention, like, I can't picture myself in Gretel's place. I'd be schmool. Yeah. And this is probably the most BS this thing. This is such a white person thing to say. Oh, God, it gets worse. Oh, okay. Writing about the Holocaust is a fraught business, and any novelist approaching it takes an enormous burden of responsibility. One that you don't take seriously, apparently. Not the burden of education, which is the task of nonfiction. <laughs> But the burden of exploring emotional truth and authentic human experiences while remembering that the story of every person who died in the Holocaust is one worth telling. For all the mistakes in her life and for her complicity in evil and for all her regrets, I believe that Gretel's story is worth telling. It's up to the reader to decide if it's worth reading. Don't read this book. It's not worth reading. I've only had to hear about it and I would say don't read it. But yeah, also, I mean, like, it is, a, if you're going to write about the Holocaust, even think, even think people read accounts. this book in school. People probably aren't going to read this book in school. Well, yeah, the first book, people read the book in school. And he's just like, oh, it's fiction, it's fiction, it's fiction. I don't have to be historically accurate. People are teaching it as the truth. Well, and that's a problem with education. Like, that's not necessarily his fault. If he wasn't promoting it as, like, a, like, I'm really If tired. he wasn't arguing... With the freaking Auschwitz. I'm really tired of people using the Holocaust as a prism to see other things. It's not a metaphor. I'm just like, why could I just read like 300 some odd pages of basically like, I'm guilty, but I'm not going to turn myself in because I'm worried about the consequences, even though she wouldn't have faced any consequences, really. What is she turning herself in for? The crime of being somebody's daughter? Like, this is just such, like, I mean, it, it's really- It's really cancel culture-y. It is really cancel culture-y. Like, he has this whole thing, like, oh, she's gonna get canceled. That's gonna be horrible. And it's like, I mean, I get kind of why she wants to hide her past, but she kind of needs to deal with that. I feel dead inside. I mean, she could have done what Hitler- but all of Hitler's like relatives did and just be like, okay, we're gonna change her name and not have kids. I mean Which like that is it that's extreme, but like I can get I, I get that. I understand that the line dies with me kind of thing if you're related to Hitler. Like also like what kind of life would your child have? Yeah, like that I can totally understand. They're like, yeah, no, we're n I don't believe that evil runs in the DNA, but like I, but like I get it. I understand the principle of the thing. Like, um, also, just for the poor kid, like... I mean, like, I've never been related to Mussolini, so, like, I just don't... It's not, like, a thing I can relate to. But, like, but my point is that, like, this is a very, like, spectator's part of history. Like, black people don't have to look at American history and be like, well, would I have been a slave owner? Because, like, their experience of American history is one in which they're chattel. And, like, their people were, like essentially forced into being a part of this country when they were just minding their business on the other side of the world. Yep, pretty much. So like, as a Jew reading this, like, oh, do, thinking about complicity, I think of myself as David, someone who's been coerced into, like, it, it's essentially been, like, I, I think of that as a non-consensual experience because yeah. this person has lied to you about everything about themselves and like, he never knew that he had this child with her. That's mm -hmm. fucking bleak. I'd much rather read a story about David. Yeah, David sounds more interesting. I mean, I'd much or rather- Or Kate. Or Kate. Like, like, literally, there are so many characters in this book who get, like, a minute. Like, what, what would Kate even exist for? Just so that she could not be homophobic? And have a housemate? I guess so. I don't really know. I'm very confused. This book was bad, and you should feel bad, John Boyne.
I we can never write another book. Let again. me look up some reviews for this book. I, I read a few, I can't remember any of them, but unfortunately it has a lot of five star reviews on Goodreads. People will rate an, would rate anything five stars on Goodreads. They're, Goodreads is not like a good consensus. I've seen like, uh, like I feel like everything has 4.5 stars on Goodreads as far as I've seen. And this is someone who uses Goodreads pretty regularly. Let's see in The Guardian. Powerful novel about secrets and atonement. Mm, this is positive. Oh, what does it say? It's from The Guardian, though. The Guardian is a conservative publication. Oh, All the Broken Places by John Boyd, an absurd novel. Oh, oh, okay. this is good. The author continues to play games of the Holocaust in the sequel to The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. When John Boyne published The Boy in the Striped Pajamas in 2006, it made such an impression that within four years I was studying it in school. People criticize it. Uh, I don't want to deal with this. Okay, hey, it used to be negative. Let's see if there's any other reviews. The Irish Times, a sequel with shortcomings. Doesn't look like the New York Times reviewed it, which is weird. Good kitty. Yeah, it didn't get a lot of reviews. Maybe that means less people read it. This seems as though it was mostly reviewed in England. Yeah. But it seems to have some negative reviews. Pippin, come here. I need you. It's okay. He can get away if he wants. This is not abuse. I love you. I love you. You're my little man. You want chocolate? I have some really good truffles that I got at Costco. Uh, sorry, I am... Um... Zoned out? Yeah. Let's finish this up. Well, thank you for watching. Like um, and subscribe. Comment down below on your thoughts on this book if you've read it. Sam had to read this book, and it was really unpleasant for her. I did not read it. So please and, and, please uh, like if, if you... And I also, during my research for this, did you know that A Boy in the Striped Pajamas fanfic exists? No, 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 that... I think you did tell me about that, but what is it about? Most of it- Is it like a coffee shop original universe? Um, well, there's one that was trying to retell it, but with members of One Direction. But most of it was like, trying to be like, I don't know, there was only like nine of them. Nine is so many. I don't know. The only one I remember is one where it was trying to make them about One Direction. Someone wrote a fan thing. Oh, it was like one chapter. Was it like One Direction in the camps? Like no, it was like literally the book word for word, just with the characters replaced with members of One Direction. I feel different now. He's purring. He's a good boy. So Sam had to suffer through this, and so did I. So please like and comment for engagement. If you're not subscribed, please do so. We'll try to post again more regularly, but I'm going through kind of a tropical depression. Um, and there's a lot just going on in the world, so stay safe. Uh, we might do an anti semite of the week about Kanye West, considering everything he's been getting up to. But uh, otherwise, like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I don't even know what this video is anymore. I know what it is, but I wish I didn't. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.